Uh, Ian's Peter, can I just um, say a personal word of thanks to you because I first met you 20 years ago, introduced to you by Anthony Cochran and Muriel Sadler and working with Paul Callan and the late Ray Crotty, uh, the effort that you put in and the others that I've mentioned succeeded in persuading the Supreme Court by a wafer-thin majority on the foreign policy issue that this was in the single European Act, something so significant in terms of giving away Irish control over our government that it was unconstitutional and the government almost got away with giving away power over our foreign policy in that single European Act 21 years ago. It was Christmas Eve, in fact 20 years ago, that Judge Barrington in the High Court at the last minute gave an injunction to Ray Crotty which stopped that in its tracks and ultimately which paved the way for the Supreme Court decision which gave us here in this room now, 20 years later, the opportunity to have a vote and as we see now, probably the only vote of any of our European compatriots on this fundamentally important new union treaty. So I want to acknowledge the people that have mentioned Eddie and Peter for that work 20 years ago, which is still very good to them. But now you can, now you can uh, win one thing. When, when neutral Ireland is now part of military actions, not decided even by the UN, unless the Irish government uh, will make that a condition, then the Irish soldier in the European army can have a little poster on the shirt saying, I'm still neutral. Because, because I wonder and can't understand why Denmark, my country, being in NATO, we are outside the European defence by a derogation, but Ireland being neutral, not in the NATO, is a full partner in the European uh, brigades. And now even in the Nordic brigades, where you take over the role Danish soldiers should have had, then the neutral Irish soldiers come and take over our job. But you can still have your poster on neutrality. Thanks very much. Okay, okay. We have to get on to the next section because it's very important and this one is on the Irish referendum and thank you Jens Peter and Klaus and Christoph. Um, you know what, you should look where uh, Patricia and Anthony vacated seats so you can actually get somewhere to sit down. Um, and for this session we're going to ask Anthony Coughlin, Patricia McCann, Anthony Coughlin there. very grateful to the opportunity of, of, of talking to this gathering and Cathy Sinnott. We're all grateful to her for enabling us to get all this information on this Lisbon Treaty. Uh, uh, I, I remember when the Coal and Steel Declaration was made, the first step in the integration process way back in 1950, the famous Schumann Declaration referred to that as being the first step in the federation of Europe. And then two years ago, Guy Verhofstadt, the Belgian Prime Minister, <laughs> said the Constitution is the um, is the Constitution of the United States of Europe, the final step, so to speak, the capstone, the keystone of the United States of Europe. So that has been the process that's been going on for a long time, uh, as uh, more and more powers go to the EU, and, and, it, and it assumes more and more of the uh, of, of, of the character of a state, and this would give us the Constitution of a state. Uh, yet wouldn't have all the functions, it doesn't do the, run the health and education system, yeah. it doesn't have much money, but it has all the powers of a state, it seems to me, apart from the power to, of sending its component elements to war against their will. They can go to war voluntarily, but otherwise it's got all the powers of a state, including taxing powers, although those have to be exercised unanimously, of course. Um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned very much has been citizenship. Uh, there's been some vague talk that we're kind of citizens of the European Union, but that has no significant uh, legal um, impact at the moment, I suggest. Um, you can only be a citizen of a state. The present European Union is not a state. Uh, it hasn't even legal personality. The community has, but not the Union. But that, of course, will all change with the Treaty of Lisbon, the Constitution. And we would make, would, would be, as the European Union becomes, in effect, a, a, quasi, a state, or has a state constitution, we become real citizens of it. And that's quite clear in the treaty. The present position is that European Union citizenship complements national citizenship. That's the 
current position. Under the Lisbon Treaty, EU constitution transformed, uh, it says European citizenship shall be in addition to national citizenship. So we'll have dual citizenship. Everyone will be a real citizen of, the Europe, of this new European Union with its uh, president and foreign minister and diplomatic service and making most of our laws, etc., etc. And we'd have real rights and obligations. We have the rights that are the Charter of Fundamental Rights. We'd have all the obligations and duties that citizens have to their state, in addition to our national citizens. That's quite normal in a federation. Uh, Klaus Heger reminds me he'd have a triple citizenship because he comes from North Rhine-Westphalia. So he's citizen of North Rhine-Westphalia, citizen of the Federal Republic of Germany, and, and then would be citizen of the European Union under the new situation. And of course, the prime obligation of a citizen is to obey the laws and to give loyalty to the authority of the state they are members of. And if there's any conflict between that obedience and loyalty, a duty of obedience and loyalty, and their national citizenship, but then uh, in the EU situation, it's the union citizenship would predominate. So we, we, the Irish people and the other 500 billion that make up the current European Union would be turned into real citizens of, 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 a, of a new European super state with all the characteristics of a state and all the obedience to its laws and law to its authority over and above our own country. That's, that's a huge change. It's a, it's a constitutional revolution for the member states and for the European Union. I believe that if the Irish people get to know what's in this treaty, common constitution, because it's both, I will make the EU and uh, give it a constitution. Uh, I believe they will, they will say no to it. Uh, and that's why it's so important to get the information out. The information we heard today, or much of it, it needs to be put in simplified form, popular form. But the key points uh, need to be got out to the uh, Irish people. Because if they don't, you know, they have the opportunity of preventing this most undemocratic setup being imposed on 500 million people. They have got that opportunity because of the Crotty case. Uh, We've got some independence, it was fought for 70 years, 80 years ago. Are we going to use that independence in effect to clamp a reactionary, backward, undemocratic constitution on 500 million people? Or are we going to say to the Prime Ministers and Presidents, go back and think again? Go back and if, if, if you want, even if you want to have a European Federation, and if the people of Europe want it, well then it should be run in democratic lines. The law should be made by people elected to make them at present. This elections the European Parliament, but the European, European Parliament cannot propose any law. So I think that's an important aspect of the thing, and one's basic depends upon the democratic instincts and feelings of the Irish people to defeat this. And I think we all have a duty as citizens to go out among our neighbours, our friends, those we can influence, set up groups or join other groups that exist in order uh, uh, where we live to, to, to combat this, to tell people about uh, what, what, what it's about and so on. Now, there's no possibility of any kind of uniform campaign on this issue. There never has been in Irish referendums. Uh, the tradition in Irish referendums has been that there's been a wide variety of groups of the left, right and centre of different interests uh, campaigning. And in many ways I think that has been a strength. The more varied the groups and interests that form to combat this, catering for their own interests insofar as they're, they're affected by this constitution come treaty, the better. Uh, I suggest that. Uh, and, but of course, then it's, it's highly desirable that people work in parallel or with some kind of perhaps informal liaison with one another, informing one another, keeping one another informed, trying to avoid sniping at one another, and, but above all, using accurate information. Because mm -hmm. I think if we've got the facts, we've got the best facts, the government will try and paint with a broad brush. Are we all in favour of the EU? Isn't, wouldn't, wouldn't we want the EU to be made more efficient, whatever that means, yeah. make more laws? Hitler was very efficient, he could produce a law every five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> What's efficiency in that context? Uh, or, you know, make the EU more effective in the world and so on. This would be broad generalisation, I think, will tend to be emphasised by the government and the yes side. It's our job to actually give people the facts, such as we've got this morning, about the huge change in the, in the character of the EU. We made a state and, and us being made real citizens of it for the first time. Uh, and and it's going to, there are going to be over 60 vetoes lost. And it's going to get in charge of our human rights and have an ultimate decision on human rights matters. <coughs> Uh, and that, um, uh, that there's self-amending clauses within it and so on and so forth. We need to get these facts across and, and that there's fundamental change in the mode of taking decisions.